So how many of us, by a show of hands here, want to be successful? Not surprising, young ambitious minds raring to go. But now let's look around our alumni, our family, our friends. What percentage of people do you think really become really successful? What do we think? Any percentages? 5%? <laughs> Most people would say 5 to 20. I see some people being very, very generous, 100%. But the question is, why would such ambitious, hardworking people fail to make the big cut? What holds them back? And I'm suggesting that maybe the reason is they fail to upgrade themselves. And hence the topic, keep walking, keep upgrading. I hope you don't remember Johnny Walker saying, keep walking, please. It's early in the morning. You see, all of us have strengths, but also some blind spots. And those blind spots, those flaws hold us back. I'm suggesting that successful people keep working on those flaws, keep improving themselves. For example, uh, in a general manager role, you start with perhaps becoming too operational only to realize that you're pushing the wall and the wall is not moving. After a while, you become too strategic, envisioning great things, but nothing happens in execution. If you are introspecting well, over a period of time, you realize that great balance between operations and strategy required to make big businesses. So, students of the world, let's start upgrading ourselves. We have nothing to lose but our chains, our flaws. What I would do in the next 15 minutes is to give you five snippets from my own life where some wise, caring mentor came to us, came to me and said, these showed me the folly of my ways and hopefully made me better. If it resonates with you, I would consider this a good session. My very first reflection is from my first role in a great company called Procter & Gamble that was posted in Japan at that time. And after my first meeting, my manager called me aside and said, what was this meeting about? And I said, this assistant brand manager was trying to orient me on the business. She laughed and said, you were supposed to learn about the business, but I saw you doing most of the topping, talking. And that's when the penny dropped. Uh, as young articulate MBAs, I was from an IM like this. You are trained to influence others. You fall in love with your own voice. Argumentative Indians, always talking, never listening. Japanese, on the other hand, are masters in the art of empathy and of listening. I think the irony is when we try to listen, we are still in reality practicing our response when there is a disagreement. That's not really empathetic listening. And think about it. We spend so many classes trying to learn speaking, trying to learn reading, trying to learn writing, but hardly any class on listening. So my very first reflection is listen, listen empathetically. Uh, there's a Native American proverb, listen or your tongue will make you deaf. My second rumination is from my second assignment. This was in a country, Philippines. And the rumination is life is only 50% fair. Deal with it. I was posted to Philippines, which had a large back office center. And I was upset. I felt the world is against me because I was moving from a developed country, Japan, to a developing country. In those days of expatriate salaries, your salaries were linked to the cost of living. And I was moving from a front-end strategy role to a back-end role. My manager took me aside and said, strategically, what do you want to do it with your career? At that time, I was in finance, so I said, I want to become a CFO. And he says, there's no chance of you becoming a CFO if you don't work on your flaw, which is accounting, because most MBAs relatively wouldn't know accounting as well as, a, as people coming from the CA or the CPA profession. I took that advice to heart, and over the next few years, spent a lot of time trying to learn accounting, so much so that I started being invited for a, a CPA continuing education lecture, and very soon also became a CFO. So my big lesson is, 
Life is only 50% fair. Control the controllables. Focus on your circle of influence. There'll be so many things beyond you. Just accept it. Shit happens, accept it. And then you also start seeing the beauty, the hidden beauty of those things. For example, in a back office role, you start learning people skills much earlier because very early on, you have a lot of people reporting to you. My third cogitation is around my third assignment, which, uh, which is around collaboration. This was in Singapore. I, I was part of the Gillette acquisition. This was the world's largest acquisition in FMCG at that time. Our business results were amazing, absolutely outstanding. But that year, is there any harm in admitting it in an open forum? My annual performance assessment came out average. I was, uh, I was aghast. You know, you feel the world is against you. My manager took me aside, our then CEO, he took me for a drink and he said, in your desire to push business results, you have developed rough edges, which is making collaboration difficult. Now, you know, when you hear something like this, you feel, oh, I'm going to resign tomorrow. This company doesn't understand those losers there. But then you sleep over it. After a few days, the reality starts hitting you. And after wrestling with it for a few days, I realized there were times when being insecure about my own career trajectory, I, I, have, I was blaming other people and making them uh, lose their trust in me. I'm supposed to take responsibility. I can't blame my juniors, but I did that. And the greatness of that company that gave me a feedback immediately. It was a wake up call in a great company, Singapore, because uh, uh, this, this, this country is uh, Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore. It's known to, uh, for, for its collaboration. So much diversity and yet so peaceful. They take everyone along. And since then, over years, uh, I've generally been called an organization builder, a magnet for talent. The point I'm trying to make is, even today, I see many young talent. You will go to the corporate world very soon. Brilliant individual performers but failing to get promoted because they fail to get people along. So collaboration, and it's difficult because it requires a win-win thinking. It requires a mindset of, it's not me versus you, it's me and you versus the problem. It requires almost a paradigm of uh, abundance, that there is enough in the world just because you will have a little more wouldn't make me get any less. So that's my third reflection, collaboration. My fourth uh, reflection is on extreme accountability. One of my friends is uh, Brent Gleason. He's a Navy SEAL in US, and he keeps talking about extreme accountability. This was, about, this was uh, in my fourth assignment in a beautiful city, Cape Town, a country, South Africa where we did a massive acquisition, CIPLA, one of the largest uh, pharmaceutical generic companies in the world, and I was posted there. As students of m &A will tell you, most m as end up in failure because of poor post-merger integration. So we had a similar situation in the first year. Many of the assumptions we had made were not uh, accurate in, in hindsight. We're all geniuses in hindsight. And because these were high visibility things, uh, Everyone was losing their head. Our then CEO, uh, Mr. Miller, took us aside and made us do one major promise. He said, we will not crib about what was given to us. We will not talk about the complain about the issues that we have inherited. There will be some strengths. That's why we acquired this company. Let's focus on those strengths. There'll be some challenges. Let's make a plan B. Over the next three years, our revenues doubled, our profits tripled, and our ROIC also doubled. So much so that it's generally regarded one of the best acquisitions in Indian Pharma, but also there's a case study written on it, which is used to teach uh, post-merger inte integration in business schools. I personally won the Young CFO of the Year Award. If it is to be, it is up to me, because leaders must take accountability. I keep telling my team now, 
that just because you have a good excuse, it does not make a bad result a good result. So people, please take extreme accountability. My final vegetation is around wisdom. My current role, uh, where I run the international markets, uh, it's a large setup, 50 different countries and their teams. In the early on in my career, I wanted to be seen as the smartest in the room. Give me a difficult problem, a conundrum, and I'll give insights, I'll do analytics. But my manager took me aside and said, now is the time to be the wisest in the room. And there's a big difference between the two. Now my job is not to solve problems. I practically cannot solve all the problems. I mean, how do I solve a problem in Colombia versus in Australia versus in Spain? I wouldn't know enough. But now is the time to understand which are the big problems to put resources behind, which, if we do a good job in it, will lead to step change results. How do you hire the right talent, hopefully better than myself, but also complementary to my own skill sets? How do you let go of some fights because the incremental cost of winning is not commensurate with the incremental cost? Incremental rewards are not commensurate with the incremental cost. And that, that journey is a very big journey moving from a state of an IQ to a state of uh, an HR professor said that early on in your career, you need IQ and hard work. Over time, you need EQ, emotional intelligence, empathy. At senior most levels, you need SQ, uh, spiritual quotient, which is about self-awareness, about humility, about a sense of purpose, about compassion. So those were my five reflections. Listen, listen with empathy. Understand that life is only 50% fair, collaborate well, take extreme accountability, and aim to be wise, not just smart. As you can imagine, to reach the next level, you cannot continue to behave what made you successful at the previous level, and you will need to keep upgrading yourself. So again, students of the world, let's keep upgrading ourselves. Find a mentor. Find friends. If you can't find anyone, become your own mentor, introspect. But almost make a behavioral CV every year and say, am I today wiser than I was one year ago? So that is it from my side. Let me leave you with a parting thought. And that parting thought is, is not coming. <laughs> the parting thought is, uh, also have fun, enjoy life. See, uh, one of my frustrations is that, especially in the corporate world and especially in Asia, we seem to be leading a very unidirectional life. Work becomes life in a classic Procrustean inversion. If you've heard of Procrustes, he was a Greek in Greek mythology. He had a bed and he used to invite travelers to the bed to rest. But anyone who was too tall, he would cut their limbs. And anyone who was too short, he would stretch their limbs to their bed. It's a macabre tale, but it has a very deep lesson. Don't change the wrong variable. The bed is supposed to fit the human, not the human to the bed. And yet, I see my friends where work has become life. Work is supposed to make life more rewarding more meaningful, more impactful, but life has become the, life has started revolving around work. I personally, uh, ferociously try to guard my personal life, uh, my personal space. I do a lot of adventure sport. Anyone for snake handling? I've held a cobra in my hand. Uh, anyone for traveling? I've been to 66 countries. Uh, book reading, I read a book a week. I have a blog, 99 books to make us wise. The point is, Life is evanescent, it has many shades, don't just enjoy one shade. So let's stop there, let us all uh, take a solemn pledge to keep upgrading ourselves, let the force be with us. Thank you.